A couple of weeks ago, this I always enjoy preaching at Christmas, but if you're not careful as a preacher, you'll, you'll preach about Mary, and you'll preach about Joseph, and you'll preach about the angels, and you'll preach about the shepherds. And I've tried to do some of those things on Wednesday night, but um, I, I kind of went a different path this year. And I guess it was, uh, someone said, uh, or I said, you know, maybe it was what I wanted to do, but it's really kind of where I felt like the Lord was leading me. Two weeks ago, we talked about the, the perfection of God's gift for us was that God had to come to earth and be born of a ba- baby uh, for us. The Son of God had to become the Son of Man. So a couple of weeks ago, I preached on the virgin birth and how that was God's great gift for us, that God in heaven did not think it's something to be grasped to to stay in heaven, but was willing to come and and to lower himself, humble himself, to be born, uh, though he had everything that was good before, all the glories of heaven, be willing to be born as a a child, a a man, uh, to, to the Virgin Mary, and, and to be to allow his coming to be so meager, so so, so um, overlooked, to be wrapped in just strips of cloth, laid in a trough with fodder for that that animals ate out of it. It's an amazing thing that God would condescend Himself so much. But that was the joy of that's the that's the story of Christmas is that God loved us so much to do those things for us. And then last week, we talked about that gift. He came to be a gift for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. The purpose of that gift was so that you and I could know eternal life. We needed a Savior. We needed something that could bridge the gap from a sinful man and a holy God. So he came knowing that he would die. He came knowing that he would have to give his life for us. So he came going to the cross where he would give his life and the tomb. So final, death on this earth we see as being the end, but it wasn't the end. Though they put him in the grave three days later, he came forth so that he could have life, but also so that he could give abundant life. Amen? The great gift is that God made a way so that we could have freedom from sin, Eternal life with Him, the glory of peace, love, joy, living with us, being in, a, in us forevermore. So today, I, I want to talk about something that we don't talk about a lot, but I want to talk about that, that gift that God wants us to be with Him. He left heaven, came to this earth, but we know that He is now back in heaven, but He's not going to leave us here. We're not orphans. We're children, right? So where he is, we're going to be as well. The Bible says in Acts chapter 8, I love this chapter so very much, but in uh, excuse me, in Romans chapter 8, in verse 32, it says this, But he who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also, listen to me now, freely give us all things? He loved Jesus, but he loves us. And he wants us to have everything that God has. John 10.10 says, I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. He came to bridge that gap so that we could have life. In John 14, it said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God? Believe also in me, he said. In my Father's house, or many mansions, many rooms, many places there for people. And if it were not so, I would have told you. Then he says, I go to prepare a place for you. If you'll choose him, he wants to be there with you forevermore. You're going to have who you are. You may think yourself as insignificant. You're not in God's eyes. I will go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there you may be also. 
from the beginning, before the cross, he said, I know I'm going to go away. I'm going to prepare a place for you, but don't think that I'm going to leave you there. I'm going to come again and, and receive you. God wants an eternal relationship with us. Amen. Now, the verse that I don't often quote is verse number four, John 14, verse four, and it says this, and where I go, you know, and the way you know. For those of you who know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and Lord, you know where he is right now, and you know how to get there. That is so vitally important. He had to come and die. He had to go to the tomb, but he was resurrected so that we could have life and we could have it abundantly, and he's not going to leave us here. He's going to come back and get us. If you have your Bibles to Acts 1 now, would you stand with me in honor of reading God's Word? Let's begin reading in verse number 4. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them. He was saying, this is what you need to do. Go do this. He commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which, he said, you have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? They had heard about the kingdom. They had heard about the Christ, the Messiah, being the King of kings and Lord of lords. Is this the time? You know, my 35 years of preaching, when I talk about these things, they always drift to the point where everybody wants to know the when. When you start talking about what someone called this morning, end times, they, they, they want to know, well, when is this going to happen, and when is this going to happen, and when is this going to happen? I'm here to tell you, that's not really important. The when is not is really as important. What, what is going to happen, that's what's important. What we need to know is not the when, but we're ready. Right? So look what it says here. He, uh, he said, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. Quit worrying about that. If Jesus is not worried about it, you don't worry about it. We don't have to know the when. What we have to do is hear everything else that has to do with the truth so we can be ready. Look in verse 8. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me. You'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit and all the power of God that comes with that. But the point is, not just so that you have it, but he says, so that you can be witnesses. Not just so that you can receive it. Praise God, you can have a relationship. But others need to know that as well. And he says here, in Jerusalem, right where they were, in Judea, that's the outskirts, Samaria, that's the places nobody really wanted to go, and to the other most parts of the world. We're to be on mission. It's not just about you receiving, it's taking what God has given you and living it. And when he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up. Taken up. The word means lifted up, raised up, raised up high. He was literally right there in their midst, standing on the ground, and the laws of gravity were suspended. He raised his hands, and he began to move up. Physically, right where he was, wasn't a figment of their imagination. He began to move up. Look what it says. While they watched, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. Can you just see Jesus go, literally, physically, just raised up, ascended back up. The cloud takes it. And they're just looking. They're steadfastly looking. They're amazed by it. You and I would be too. Verse 10, and while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? Come on now, listen. This Jesus, this very Jesus, this same Jesus that you just saw, who was taken up from you into heaven, there it is, taken up again, lifted up, raised up, raised up high into heaven, 
This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner, in the same manner, in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Let's pray. Father God, we uh, thank you for your word. We love your word. We love that you uh, speak truth to us. We love that you are the God of joy and of love and of peace and how wonderful it is to know you and to walk with you. Father, I pray that in the next few moments that you will teach us from your word, remind us from your word that we're not just about being here. We're about being with you. And Lord, you're not going to leave us here forever. But there's a day promised, there's a day coming. We're going to be with you forevermore. Father, may we be about your business and may we be prepared for our eternity even today. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You may be seated. Scripture tells us, let me share with you Hebrews chapter 9, verse 28. It says this, so Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. That's the cross. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time, apart from sin, for salvation. Christ is coming again. He spoke to John on the Isle of Patmos in Revelation chapter 1. John, one of the ones who was there in Acts 1, who watched gravity be suspended and watch Jesus physically go up and ascend back to heaven. He says here, behold, he is coming with clouds and every eye will see him. Even those who pierced him, all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Even so, amen. The word amen means it is true. So be it. Like that it says in the book of, in the book of Revelation, it is true. Even so come Lord Jesus. It says in verse 8, I am the Alpha. I was there, the Almighty God at the beginning. I had no beginning. I was always God there. I am the Alpha and the Omega. The end. I'll still be God. He says, the beginning and the end, says the Lord. Who was, or excuse me, who is, and who was, and who, who is to come, the Almighty. You see, one of the things that amazes me is we have the, the proper theology to believe that he's almighty God, always eternal. No matter how far back you wanted to go, God was there. Amen and powerful. Right? We also have the theology that we understand and believe that God will always be here. In a trillion, billion, zillion, whatever, billion years from now, he's still going to be almighty God. Amen? He's going to be God that is fully love, fully joy, fully peace. He is the Almighty, the sustainer of all. We have a theology that believes he was there and he will always be there. We're just not too sure that he's with us now. We believe he's the Almighty God who could create the world. We know he's the Almighty God who can create the new heaven and the new earth. We're just not too sure that he can help us in this world that we are. We have a limited understanding of God. We go by what we see and not what we can't see, but we know to be true. We are now walking by faith. We're not walking by sight. But I'm here to tell you, God is there and he's with us and he says, I will not leave you. I love the book of John. And in John chapter 5, in verse 28, it says this. Do not marvel at this. For the hour is coming, by the way, it's still coming, in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. God is coming to gather his people home. In the next chapter, chapter 6, he has a different conversation. And in verse 39, he says this. This is the will of the Father who sent me, that of all he has given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up at the last day. And this is the will who sent me, 
that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. If you believe in God, and you believe in Jesus Christ, God's Son coming to this earth, and you believe that he lived a sinless life, and you believe that he died on the cross for your sins, and you believe that they buried him, but that he rose again three days later, and you believe that he's in heaven right now, you need to understand that God is there for you. God has all this in control, and he will call us to himself. Now, one of the ways that we will go to be with him is through the avenue of death. And it's been happening that way for a lot of times. I think I said last week, and y'all know that my spiritual gift is being a smart aleck, but here's the odds. One out of one of us are going to die. Y'all like those odds? It is appointed to man once to die, and after that, the judgment. So you do your living now, but you do your planning for the judgment now, and you better get ready. We see, death is nothing really to be feared, because the Bible says absent for the body is what? Present with the Lord. We'll talk about that scripture more in just a second. Please understand this. Please, please understand this. Death is nothing more than the gateway to glory. And if God tarries, and it's been two millennials and God's tarried, then we're all going to have to go through that avenue of death. But that's a good thing. Can't get to heaven without it. Unless you're alive when he comes back to gather his children. That's called the rapture. The rapture. Now, here's what the word rapture means. It literally means the snatching away. He comes down and he says, you're mine? Come on, we're going home. No matter where you're at, if you're in the grave, if you've already died. Now listen, for those people who have already died, their soul, their spirit is in glory. One of the confusing things is, is that people, when they think about future things to come, they get a little bit of that and a little bit of this and a little bit of that, and they get all the time frames mixed up, right? And, 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 but God, he's got all these things properly in order, right? So the first thing that's going to happen, if you are a believer from good old Abel, you remember Adam and Eve had a boy named Abel who was killed by his brother Cain, right? When, when, when Cain killed Abel, Abel immediately went to be with the Lord in the presence of the of, of the God right now, in his presence. He is there in the heaven that is there right now. And all the way from him forward, people have been dying, either looking to the Savior for what the Savior would do, or for us, looking back to the cross, what Jesus did. And when you die today, if you're a believer, you immediately go there. But they take your body, and they'll have a funeral service, and they'll put it in a coffin. By the way, it doesn't matter if it's a wood coffin. And I've seen some people spend a lot of money on coffins, and they, I got the word this time. I couldn't remember the word vault in the first service. Y'all know what I'm talking about when I say a vault? I mean, they're going to lock you up in that vault, and you're going to have the one that says, it doesn't matter. From dust we come to dust we shall return, Right? I know some loved ones, well, I'm going to take care of them. You don't have to worry about that. God's going to take care of them, right? What about those that are cremated? It don't matter. From dirt we come to dirt we'll go. My wife says, you're not going to be cremated. I said, I don't care. I'm not going to be here. I just can't put you through the fire. I'm not going to the fire. <laughs> amen? She just can't stand the thought of it, right? Say amen, Lynn. All right, that's up to her. I won't be here, right? But what happens to those people who fall into the water? What happens to those people who, who get their, their body gets blown up and something or something like that? Look, when God comes, he will raise those people up. It's called the rapture. What about those people who die that are unbelievers? What about, those, what about the people who don't trust in Jesus Christ as their Savior and Lord? 
The Bible says that when they die, they go to a place called hell. Sheo, the grave, Gehenna. And it's not going to be good. It's not going to be good. Fire, brimstone, weeping, gnashing of teeth. Do you know that Jesus taught more about hell than he did heaven? He came to make a way. He came so that we would not have to die in our sins and go through eternal punishment. He came to make a way. But they go there for a time and for a season. But Scripture tells us that the next thing that's going to happen is going to be all the... And by the way, I know of no prophecy that yet needs to be fulfilled before the rapture of the church. So, it says in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 6, so we are always confident. I like that word always confident. Do you? Look up there on the screen. We are always confident knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For right now, we walk by faith and not by sight. I'm looking forward to the day when I walk by sight and not by faith. Amen? When I'm in his presence. But he says, we are confident, yes, well pleased, rather to be absent from the body and be present with the Lord. And when, we, when he does take us, we're going to be like him. 1 John 3, 2 says, Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed, we will be like him. For we shall see him as he is. What are we going to be like? We're going to be like him. So the next thing that's going to happen is what is called the rapture of the church. If you have your Bibles, it's going to be on the screen, but if you want to look with me, it's in 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4. I'm going to do my best to speed up. Y'all put on your spiritual seatbelts and y'all tune up. Here, we're about to take off. Ready? Look what God's Word says. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13. I do not want you to be ignorant. I want you to know the truth. I want you to make your decisions based on what is best. I don't want you to just walk around without having the understanding. He said, I, I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, those that have already died, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. That means those who've, who've died, we put them in the ground, but their souls and their spirits are with him. When he comes back, he's going to bring those souls with him, that spirit of us. He's going to bring that with him. Okay? <clears throat> For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive, it means if it happens now and we're alive, and remain until the coming of the Lord, will by no means precede those who have fallen asleep, who, are, who have died. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the trump voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up. There's the word again. Be lifted up, raised up, raised up high. We will be we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Thus we shall always be with, our, with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Literally, he is saying he's going to come, he's going to blow the trumpet, he'll take all those that have died, believers, and he'll give them a body again. And if we're alive, when it happens, we will be changed. Take your Bibles and look in uh, 1 Corinthians Chapter number 15. 1 Corinthians chapter number 15. Verse number 50 says this. I know I'm reading a lot of Scripture, but wouldn't you rather know what God's Word has to say? By the way, I'm leaving out a whole lot that, that just amplify it, but I'm just, for time's sake, I'm just trying to give you the headlights. The highlights, excuse me, not the headlights. As soon as that came out of my mouth, I said, no, that's wrong. Look in verse number 50. 
Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, and that, nor does corruption inherit corruption, incorruption. How many of you have sinned? That's corruption. So you can't go from sinful to, to, to just remain in that and go to heaven. It's got to be a changing to move you from that, from the mortal to the immortal, from the corruption to the incorruption. Verse 51, behold, I, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, not all die, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. The word twinkling there literally means as, as quickly as you look at something, you recognize it. Y'all look up here. Did y'all see that? I mean, when you just started to see my hand move, that was the twinkling. It's quicker than blinking your eye. It's quicker than, it's just a immediate, all right? That's what it's, it means here. In a moment, immediately, the twinkling of an eye, the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible. And we shall, those of us, if we're alive when that happens, we're going to be changed. In that twinkling of an eye, we're going to be changed. For this corruption must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. That's the rapture of the church. That's the rapture of the church. Now, they didn't fully understand it. Old Testament Scripture, it talked a lot about Jesus coming. It talked a lot about Him being the Christ, the Messiah, the King of kings, the Lord of lords. He would come and He would put down rule. Right? He would rule with a rod of iron. He would, he would put away sin. He would redeem nature. Nature would have the opportunity that God wanted it when he first created it. But what they didn't understand was this thing that we call the church age, where you and I live for Christ and we give our heart and life to Christ. and We become witnesses like X1 told us that we're supposed to be. So sometimes... People misunderstand the rapture with the second coming. The first time he came in the air, and he called us, and we were changed, and we meet the Lord in the air, and we go back to be with him in heaven. But there's some other stuff that's going to be happening on earth. Now, in heaven, all us believers, all us Christians, we will stand before what is called the judgment seat of Christ. We won't be judged by if we're a Christian. You wouldn't be there if you weren't a Christian. But you will be judged by what you've done with your salvation, what you've done with your Christianity, what you've done with your opportunities, God. Have you lived for Christ or did you just live for yourself? Remember the parable of the talents? As you have been given... So you will have to give an account. That's what, what's happened. And then the, the marriage supper of the Lamb, Revelation 19. What a wonderful time it's going to be. What a wonderful time it's going to be. But by the way, it even gets better. Well, when the God comes and raptures the people out and takes them back to heaven, what's going to be left on earth? I mean, all the saved are gone. Just unbelievers. People who do not know God as Savior. People who are not following His way and His truth. Now what's the world going to be like? There were some that are going to give it this. Here's the holy word for it. Uh-oh. There are some that are going to have heard the message of Christ. I wonder what church is going to be like that day. When they go and the preacher's not there. By the way. If you don't know Jesus and God raptures them out, if you're coming here looking for me, you're looking in the wrong place. I'm out of here. But I wonder about all the other people that are going to be looking around and say, ooh, we messed up. But people ask this question all the time. Why wouldn't God just say enough? Why would he give this what Daniel called this seven-year period? Daniel, Daniel took all the, the writings that God gave him and he wrote them all down and at the end of the book of Daniel, it says he sealed them up. Then when you get to Revelation chapter 5, that book is there and, and who's worthy to open the book? 
just the one. The Lamb of God, as though he had been slain from the foundation of the world. He comes and he opens it up. Jesus Christ opens up that book that, that God gave Daniel. And that's chapter 6 through chapter 18 of the book of Revelation. It talks about the tribulation. That's what it's called. Tribulation, great tribulation. And it's going to be bad on earth. Unbelievable, unbelievers ruling. There is the Trinity, which is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. But you know, there's an unholy Trinity too that will be revealed. Instead of God the Father, there will be Satan. You know, he, he likes imitation. He doesn't do anything original. So he puts himself like, like opposite of God. And opposite of Jesus will be what is called the Antichrist. And opposite of the Holy Spirit will be called the false prophet. And the Antichrist, all these unbelievers there, and he's going to be going out, and he's going to be, man, it's going to be ugly. And for seven years, it looks like he's going to be winning. Why does God allow this? Y'all listen real plain. There's a group of people that the Lord loves. We know unbelievers. He loves all of them. But the Jewish people who have not accepted Christ, he's going to give them one last chance. And I mean a last chance. Do any of y'all ever have a parent that got on to you and said, oh, I'm not going to punish you yet, but I'm going to give you one more chance, but I'm here to tell you, you better get this right. Did y'all ever have that parent? No. Lord, y'all needed to come visit with me. Praise God, mom and dad gave me a second chance. Sometimes a 20-second chance. Sometimes dad would just drop his head and mom would just roll her eyes at me. But I'm here to tell you, God's going to give them one last chance. And it's not going to be easy. But the Bible says that there will be many who will get saved during that seven-year period. And that will be glorious and that will be wonderful. But at the end of that seven-year period, it says Jesus will come again. This time, not just to get the church and take the church back to heaven, but he will come back to put literally his feet down on this earth. And for 1,000 years, it's called the millennial reign, he will reign in righteousness on the earth. <clears throat> the false prophet and the Antichrist will be taken and thrown into what is called the lake of fire. Satan will be taken and bound in chains and put in a place called the bottomless pit. You may say, preacher, what's the bottomless pit? It's a pit that doesn't have a bottom. It's a bottomless pit. I have no more further inspiration than that for you. I can tell you it's not going to be good. And he'll be held there for a thousand years. And we're going to have a wonderful time in heaven for those that were saved and those that got saved during the tribulation, it's going to be wonderful. And the Lord will reign on this earth. The lion will lay with the lamb. The baby will play at the, the, where the, the hole at the, where the serpents are, the snakes are. Not fear, because Christ is Lord and in charge. But at the end of that thousand years, for whatever reason, God let Satan loose. God let Satan loose. Now, during the time of the tribulation before the thousand years began, there are some that trust Jesus. When God comes back, they're given their new body and they'll reign with him. There are some that take the mark of the beast, the mark of the Antichrist, and they will be killed. And they'll go to hell and wait for judgment. But there will be some that don't get saved and some that don't take the mark of the beast and they will live on. And at the end of that thousand years when Satan is released, he goes for what, what the Bible calls a season and deceives and gets them up and they think that they're going to overthrow Christ again. You see, you think Satan would learn, but he never learns. Never learns. And there's a battle that is fought there. You may have heard about it called Armageddon. 
I know I'm going quickly, but just say, Satan lose, Satan loses, and it's done. And every unbeliever, from the very first to the very last, will be resurrected, come on now, and will stand before what is called the great white throne judgment. I'm sorry I don't have the time. It's in Revelations 19. But they will stand before God. God will say, depart from me. I don't know you. They will be judged. Their name's not written in the book of life. And they will be taken and thrown into what is called the lake of fire. Forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever without any hope. Never experiencing the love of God. His purity, His joy, His peace. You hear me say it all the time. There is, there is, if you do not trust Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, there are consequences. God loves you. God wants to spend eternity. He wants to give you everything that is His blessing. He wants you to experience those things forevermore. But if you don't want to be His child, He's not going to force you. But you'll live in darkness. You'll live with the absence of love, with the absence of joy forevermore. That's tough. That's mighty tough. This earth will be gone. It'll be dissolved up. Revelation 21 says there'll be a new heaven and a new earth. And from that point forward, there will never be a shadow of any place where sin has ever been, even for a second. That's why he lets all the rest go. He gives us something new. Where we can look forward with joy, we can have peace in our heart. Jesus said this, and I know I've preached a long time, but Jesus' words in John chapter 13 say this. From now on, I am telling you before it comes to pass, so that when it does occur, you may believe that I am He. I'm here to tell you, He is Lord. He is God. He is Savior. He is King. Right now, He is at the right hand of the Father. He knows every hair on your head, every thought in your heart. He knows every consequence of everything that you've been through. And He wants you to choose Him. He wants you to choose life. He wants you to choose all the good things that He can give you. Not because you deserve it. He just wants you to have it. And the wisest decision any person can, person can ever make is recognizing that they have sin and that they need a Savior and they're willing to confess their sins and turn from that and come and give their heart and life to Him. Why would we believe that God is the God eternal from Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, but we wouldn't give Him the reign of our life now? Why wouldn't we want to do that? And yet so many do. There's a great theologian of a couple centuries ago. His name was A.W. Pink. He made this statement. The first time Christ came to slay sin in men. Praise God He did. But He says the second time He will come to slay men in sin. Those that are redeemed, those that are bought again, those that are saved will be with Him forevermore. But those that do not know Him will stay in their sin forevermore. C.S. Lewis wrote a book called The Case for Christ. I say this in closing. Here's his quote. 
For this time it will be God without disguise. Something so overwhelming that it will strike either irresistible love or irresistible horror into every creature. It will be too late then to choose your side. Choose today. Choose today. Lewis also said this, precisely because we cannot predict the moment, we must be ready at all times. If you're not ready to meet the Lord, you need to get ready today. If death comes to you now and you haven't given your heart and life to Christ, you've made your decision and you'll be separated from good and God forevermore. That's why I plead. That's why I'm very passionate about this. Bobby Welch, who was president of the Southern Baptist Convention, he was pastor of the First Baptist Church of Daytona Beach, Florida. He was preaching a sermon on hell. And a person came up to him afterwards and said, do you really believe that? He said, I really do. You really believe that a person will be separated forever? They'll never know anything that's good. They'll be tormented forever? Bobby Welch said, yes, I do. He said, I don't believe that, but if I did... I would get on my hands and knees and crawl any place in the world just to tell someone so that they would not have to go through a place that you just described. And it makes me wonder why we live our lives for ourselves when God who has blessed us with so very much, and by the way, and will take such gloriously good care of us, while we're not about his business here on earth. Here's the truth. He's coming. I don't know when. You don't know when. How many of us have traveled down the road and saw an accident where someone went to find their eternal destiny? They weren't expecting it that day. How many of us have, how, how many of us have seen one die of a heart attack a stroke, cancer, and yet not prepared, or died of old age, or just died. We don't know when, but one out of one of us are going to die. And after that, the judgment. The story of Christmas is that God loved you enough to come and live for you, and die for you, so you can be with him forevermore. It's coming. It's coming. 